Next, let's look at one-sided relationships where one species benefits at the expense of another. The first category we'll look at is predation, where the predators benefit by harming the prey. Let's look at the ecological impacts of predation first. Here's a study from northern Tanzania where lions were temporarily removed from an ecosystem. And we'll look at the impact that this removal of the predator had on the density of oribi, impala, topi, Thompson's gazelle, and warthog. Now, prior to the lion's removal, the oribi population was held pretty low by predation. So was the impala population, so was the topi, gazelle, etc. When the lions are removed from the area, the oribi, impala, topi, gazelle, and so on populations all exploded. And then when lions came back to the area, the prey populations again declined. So this burst in number when the lions have been removed is known as release. And each one of these herbivore species shows signs of release from predation. Their numbers increased dramatically. Now, evolutionary responses of predation can be extraordinarily diverse. Predation is life or death for the prey, so we'd expect to see lots of adaptations to minimize their risk of being eaten. So we're not surprised to see that a lot of the fastest running organisms on Earth are prey species that are built for speed to avoid being captured by cheetah. We've also seen in the lecture on sociality that there's great advantages from the dilution effect, which is the anonymity of the herd. There's only one predator likely to attack this herd of wildebeest. The individual chances of being ch chosen are very, very low indeed. And it also influences behavior in ways I didn't discuss before, in that prey species are often really paranoid. They're always looking out for the risk of a predator sneaking up on them, so they show an extraordinary amount of vigilance. A very common evolutionary response to the risk of predation is seen in insects. We've already seen in the peppered moth that they stand out a mile in polluted backgrounds, but were very well camouflaged against lichen. In contrast, the melanistic form, which became very common during the Industrial Revolution, is very hard to spot against a polluted background. Camouflage has many different forms, so some butterflies have evolved to mimic the shape of a leaf. Some insects are now very spindly and they look like twigs, stick insects. So this kind of camouflage is very common in these small insects. Plants, again, have different ways of dealing with predation. They can't run away. All they can do is to become very nasty in the way they taste. So a lot of them produce what are called secondary compounds. They're secondary because they're not essential for their own survival, but they're effective chemical defenses against predation. Chrysanthemums produce pyrethrins. Pyrethrin is a compound that we actually extract from flowers and we make into commercial insecticides. But the chrysanthemum uses it itself to try to prevent its flowers from being eaten by herbivorous insects. And yes, a lot of the things that we use recreationally, at least some people do, like tobacco. Tobacco gives you a high because you get the nicotine, and the nicotine is the plant's way of killing insects. So every time you light up, the buzz you get is a poison. And likewise, the active compound in the coca leaf, which can be extracted and purified in the form of cocaine is ultimately an insecticide. So these are powerful compounds in our bodies because they evolved in the plants to try to kill whatever is bothering them. So all I'm trying to say here is that predation is ubiquitous. It is in all kinds of different organisms, whether it's plants or animals, and this has driven the evolution of a very wide variety of defense mechanisms, ranging from camouflage to high speed to insecticides.